So programming. Configurable versus programmable. All right? That's what we were talking about here a little bit ago with the uh, with PCG. Um, this is huge if you're the guy that's going to go out and, and program this stuff, okay? If you're going to go out and be the one that's going to put this stuff in, you're going to want to know if your controller is configurable or programmable because it's going to save you a ton of time. But if you go the easier route, it may, may give you a headache because you can't make it do what you want it to do. So you need to know the differences in this. All right, so this is the best analogy I can come up with. I've got about two or three or four, but um, programmable, configurable. I think of programmable is you're going to eat a hamburger, all right? You need to know every single thing that goes into making a hamburger. You're going to have to know that you're going to have to cook it. You're going to have to know that you need ground beef of some sort, a bun, lettuce, ketchup, mustard, pickles, whatever. You've got to know that, okay? You can't just go up and say, all right, I, you know, this is what it is. You've got to know how to cook it. You've got to know everything about making this hamburger, okay? That's programmable. So think about it also as if you, if you walked up to the, to the bar and you said, I want a Long Island. And the bartender said, what's in a Long Island? And you've got to be able to tell them. That's programmable, okay? Configurable is you walk up and you choose from the menu board at McDonald's or wherever and you say, I want a hamburger, I want a chicken sandwich, I want a hot dog, okay? And then he's just going to say, or, or she, and just say, well, do you want ketchup or mustard on that, all right? It's the same thing as like if any of you guys do photography of, of any kind, you got the auto setting on your camera and you got the manual setting. All right, if you put it in auto, there's a lot of little, little things that you got to know here and there. You can take a picture and it not turn out good at all. You put it in auto and it does it for you. All right, but then if you want to blur the background like you see the professionals do, you can't do that in auto. You got to put it over in the manual. You got to know a little bit more. Okay. <clears throat> a lot of times you're going to see. Um, you know, configurable controller is going to be application specific. It's going to be for, for a VAV, all right? So, because you just do, you know, hundreds of boxes usually, and they're all going to pretty much be the same program. The last thing that you want to do is sit down there and just, okay, I need this over here and I need this here, and you just start from scratch and whatever. If you can just take that, what you've already done, and pop it into something else, um, and just say, boom, go to the other 99 boxes, well, man, you're, you, you've cut your time by 90%, okay? Now we talked about, and someone was supposed to remind me so somebody's not doing their job, um, PCG, this is this controller right here, okay, Johnson Controls. This is actually programmable and configurable, right? Um, programmable and configurable. So you're going to start out and it's going to ask you a series of questions, okay? This is the tool, PCT, that you program PCG or PCV or whatever PC line of controller that you're using. So when you go into it, it's going to say, what system type do you have? Well, you're going to pull it out. I got a VAV. What's your system configuration? One duck, two duck. Okay, system of units, Fahrenheit, Celsius, whatever. Whatever you want. It's just going to continue to ask you questions. And after you answer questions for about two or three minutes, it's actually going to, it's going to sit there and do a little dance on your computer screen and then it's going to pop out this wire sheet which probably took this guy anywhere from 45 minutes to a couple days depending on how robust and, and crazy he's getting it and this thing pops out in about 10 minutes okay if that but what's neat about the PCG is that you're not stuck with what you see right there on you know what you're done with you can actually go in and then open up your wire sheet and say well you know I don't want to connect this to this anymore, I want to connect this to this up here. And you can make that change, or you can add something in, or you can take something away. But it's excellent when you can get out there in a job and it's just something basic, and you just go boom, here I am off to the races. Now Honeywell also offers um, some configurable controllers as well, so don't think that you have to go with, with one or the other just if you want to do configurable. But I'm seeing more and more and more stuff um, going the configurable route and programming a lot more easier just because it seems like, um, I always struggle on how to say this, but in reality we're, we're just getting dumber, okay? There's the guys out there that understand computers really well, and there's guys that understand systems really well. What we're lacking are the people that understand both really well, okay? And so if I can give you a configurable controller, 
then a lot of times the people that understand the systems really well can do with that. The guys that understand the, the programs really well, they want a programmable controller. They can go in there and do what they want. Hope I didn't offend anybody with that, but that's, that's just the reality the way I see it. <clears throat> all right, front end. So all of this resides in the JACE, all right? Now we're gonna get into graphics. So you saw this on that video before. So we can go in here and see your your, uh, your duct system and, and uh, see your zone temp, your return air temp, your, your fan is on, um, you know, your, your mixed air temp, etc. You can see all that stuff. You can go in, this is a, that's a uh, chiller there, now it's all set up. This is pretty neat, this is trending. So let's just say that you want to go into a uh, a new building. What a lot of guys are doing now is they're going in and they're taking a meter and a front end and they're installing into the building and they're getting a reading on what that building has um, and, and how they're trending for energy usage and they go in they analyze that data and they come back in and do a proposal and say look I can save you this much money, I can give you this much ROI, you know I can I can go this route for you um, and they're doing all that with some sort of graphics that are trending graphics etc. Okay. What we're going to get into now is an in-depth explanation of the JACE, okay? And this is uh, Johnson Controls um, PowerPoint presentation that I borrowed from them and uh, because it, it does an excellent job. All right, so this again is another uh, system architecture similar to what we have here <clears throat> with, your, uh, with several JACEs installed sucking in several different buildings of controllers or, or uh, floors or whatever, okay? So we already know that um, they provide network management, integrated service, one or more network of field devices. It's the thing that communicates to all the other controllers. So what we're gonna see here is there's a backnet trunk, okay? Running from one JACE out to all the several controllers into in LawnWorks for this example. All right, those are the latest and greatest BACnet FX PC controllers from Johnson Controls. They're sitting on a BACnet communication bus, okay? Add some TEC net stats. Now, something kind of interesting happened here, okay? We added controllers to every communication bus and it said they're all legacy FX field controllers. That's why the JACE is so darn neat is because the legacy FX controllers were, some of them were LAN, some of them were N2, some of them were BACnet. So somebody asked earlier about different, different uh, controllers you know, sitting on. You don't have to have you know, all the latest and greatest. So this kind of goes into what you and I were talking about a second ago offline is that you can have the newest stuff sitting on the same bus as the old stuff and it doesn't matter. So if you're going to go in and, and, and retrofit a building, you can leave what's working currently in place and then add the new stuff either as you get money or um, you know if you want to replace a floor or a building or something like that or you can work in, you know as, it, as they break. So you have one controller that, that goes bad that's an old controller, you replace it with a new one, you put it on the same bus, you're good to go. Okay? Sure. Should you have uh, Honeywell and Johnson Control on the same bus? Yep, I'm sure you can. Same protocol? Same protocol. That's all that matters. It needs to be the same protocol. Now, keep in mind that what you're buying here, like if you want to set up and you want to be a contractor for this stuff, you, you pay all sorts of licensing and set up fees and all that types of stuff and yearly renewals and, and all that. And if you don't pay your yearly renewal, then you can't go and program this stuff. Okay? Um, the controllers have their own proprietary, and let me scare you, they have their own proprietary programming tool for the controller. Okay? So, I say this with tongue in cheek, a Johnson Controls guy can't program a Honeywell controller and a Honeywell controller can't you know, program a Johnson, but somehow or another they all figure it out. I don't know how, but they do. Um, so, they'll be able to. Um, so, when I take over a building, I'm not going to be able to um, this is a bad instance because this is all Johnson Controls, but let's just say that, you know, for your example, you know, these are Johnson Controls and these were Honeywell. Um, once these go bad, I couldn't go in there or something needed to be changed. I couldn't go into that, that specific controller and change it because I can't get into that protocol. Can't, or that, not protocol, I can't get into that controller and change what's in there, okay? 
Where I can do what I can do though is suck all of those different points up into a JACE and manipulate them from up there. Okay, so you just kind of get like an overview of what you have. Is that fuzzy to anybody? Anybody have a question on that? <clears throat> so you can see there's a gazillion different things that you can do. All right, so. Here's what I want. All right, what we're doing here, these are all talking Modbus, BackNet, Lawn. We're sucking all these up into a Jace, and we're doing something called relativizing them. The Jace turns those into Niagara points. Niagara is the computer system owned by Tritium that is, is what the Jace uses to, to program and set everything up. So you're, you're taking all these different points down here, up into here, make them the Niagara points. So then you can share them, they're the same now, okay? <clears throat> so there's four different, there's actually eight because there's two of each one. This is not important for you to remember. This is if you're gonna get into programming, but the different points, numeric Boolean enumerated string, you're gonna take, so if you had a BACnet VV controller with a, with a uh, set point, you know, of, of whatever, that's going to suck up into the JSON. and it's going to turn it into a numeric writable point. That's a little bit confusing, but just know that the JSON is what's actually taking those up and putting them into a language that it can understand, a universal language. Oh yeah. Yeah, I have a system that turns some kind of European measurement into it's on the line work. So yep. I don't really like it. Yep. Because if you don't don't have the numbers and all in box is just right, mm. it can Yep. You got it. It's a uh, um there there's some people don't have Jaces don't even know that they have Jaces. You probably have something different, but you know, you it's just all it's doing is just taking stuff up, putting it into a universal language. So exactly right. Um, those numbers, we were just talking about the pins on the boxes. You said the numbers on the, uh, the program. Yes, my billing has ten half the building is ten pins. Okay. And the pro yes, my building has ten half the building has been reworked into line boxes okay. from an older system. And in the boxes the Boolean part of that programming, there is link, there's some kind of a European measurement that changes it to uh, a measurement that I understand here in America. They must, some of these systems must be built for all over the world usage. And, and if, the, if the box has the wrong number in them, then I want 200 CFM coming out of the VAB if there's the right, the wrong number in the box, the Boolean box, it can make it 800 CFM. You know, it's weird. What's I don't that? care for it at all. I feel like. um, nope, that's that's okay. for that's for networking. Okay. Um, so, <clears throat> thanks for that. The um, so supervisory controllers or JSIS provide system-wide coordination, automation, control, scheduling, alarming, historical data management, data sharing, control logic, interlocking for all connected devices. All connected devices. These things are all talking with each other. They're sharing set points if they need to. They're coordinating equipment if they need to. Um, they're all working in, in one system. There's a manager telling them all what to do now, okay? <clears throat> I'm not exactly sure why they do this slide, but it basically is just saying that you can take what's in the JACE and you can upload it into a server. Um, and you can access it from, uh, from an iPhone, an iPad, um, you know, uh, any, anything that you can get you a network connection. If you're set up to, to open it up that way, you can go in and look and make and read and everything else, okay? All right, this is Johnson Control's representation of the three JSTs that they carry. Every Tritium JACE that's out there comes in three sizes. Okay, they're FX20, FX60, FX70 is what Johnson Controls calls it. Vicon is 
is uh, tritium's line of J's. So, so that's, that is the, the J's, but like I said, it's the same as all the rest of them. They do um, a J's 2, a J's 6, and a J's 7. Honeywell does a Web 201, a Web 600, a Web 700. Good. Um, yeah, I thought you were going to say something. Yeah, I was going to ask, is it, is it just the inputs that are different on how many zones it controls? The yep, we're good. one second. Okay. In the, uh, no, please ask questions. Please ask questions. The, um, so, the 60 and the 20 are the same physical size. The FX70 is much bigger, okay? Um, they're all DIN rail mountable. You can screw them into a wall. Um, there's different uh, power supplies that you can use. You can use you know, one that goes into a wall module and, and so you can sit there and, and troubleshoot at your desk or program at your desk. Um, and then you can do the power supply like this right here that sits on the DIN rail um, and just kind of plugs right into the Jace. Okay, so there's different options. Um, I'm not going to talk about I.O. modules, that just gets really confusing. I.O. modules are basically a way to make your JSA controller, but don't, don't get more involved past that. Um, I think I missed the... I thought I had a slide coming up that was going to show the different stuff, but I guess I missed it. Um, so I'll touch on your question now. So essentially, the reason there's three different JCs, there there are three different sizes of what they're able to handle. So if you have a really big job and you're going to have a ton of network activity, you need you know uh, FX70. Okay. If you're gonna, so if you're going to do just a small little job, you're just going to pull in a couple of VAV boxes and, and a rooftop unit. You could get by with just using you know an FX20, something small. So it's all based on how much you're sucking in to that system, how robust. It really is. There's no more I.O. points added to it, nothing like that. It's purely down to, um, you know, what it is. You may have a, an FX60 and you may have one air handler that you're pulling into it and it was too big for an FX20 because you just got tons and tons and tons of stuff that you're sucking into it. So it really boils down to just what, you know, how much you need. Does that make sense? Does that make sense, everybody? Good. What what limits it? Is it the, the number of uh, communication modules that you have on the system, or is it the number of days change yet? It's like the it, it's it's aggravating because it's the gray area of controls. Okay, no one comes out and says you can have a thousand points on an FX60. You can have 85 controllers on an FX60. They don't say that. Um, what happens is just over time, you know that roughly. That's about what you're going to have for an FX60. You're going to usually be able to pull in about a thousand points and usually about a hundred controllers for an FX60. Um, usually, you know, for an FX20 or a Web 201, something like that, you know, you're going to pull in obviously probably about half of that. And then if you're going to go up to a Web 700, you're going to pull in more. But again, you know, I can have one controller with 30 or 40 points in it doing some crazy logic like. Um, like the rooftop units, like the Aeon units and, and stuff like that that you see. We have a guy um, that programs spiders for that. And those things, one of them talks to an FX60. It's way too robust to talk to just an FX20. It actually talks to a Web 600. It's Honeywell. It would also just depend on the speed of, of your network as well, too. Like, what you, does it just get to the point where it starts bogging down? Or right. Is that instantaneous generic value that you see on your front end? That's a, Right. It's the same thing as like, you know, your computer at home. If you open up Photoshop and then you open up five instances of a web browser and then you, you do something else and all of a sudden your, your computer just slows to a crawl, that's the same thing. That's what that is, is a, is a computer. And so the more stuff that you open, the less it gets. So you don't want to obviously have a slow system, so you want to be able to size your JS appropriately. And sometimes the best thing to do is to get multiple FX60s or Web 600s tie those together and use a supervisor. Sometimes that's the most cost effective way instead of trying to do one great big web 700. Sure. Rob, also if you do more, in other words, on my lawn floor, we trend uh, CFMs and space temperature and when the heat's on the PIUs, we can <coughs> trend that. So 
I think is that part of the yep. building that may make it bigger. Correct. You have to step up. If you're doing lots of trending and reports and stuff, yes. Like if you're the big uh, uh, manufacturing facilities, they have to keep logs of what everything you know did and was and what it was at this time. So if something bad happens, they can go back in and prove that hey, this was right, or hey, we were wrong. So they're doing trending all day long, and it's stuff running in the background. So for that, they probably have a really robust Jace pulling all that different stuff in. Okay? Communication cards. This is where it gets really, really, really neat. It's not very confusing. It's just really neat. Okay. So... We've got lawn VAV controllers. They're daisy chained together. They're going into a J, same as these rooftop units that are back net and the VFD that's Modbus. And they're all going into here. We now need to install a certain piece of hardware on that Jace to be able to allow for a connection for those, those uh, boxes and controllers that you see up there, okay? So the top right one is a lawn works card. So I'm going to physically take the plastic cover off that Jace and install a LawnWorks card. And so I'm going to daisy chain up, boom, I'm going to plug right in into a physical lawn card that sits here. Now the dual RS-485 card does several different communication protocols. For instance, it does BACnet and it also does Modbus, right? So I can take one dual port RS-485 card, install it right here, and I can install, I can pull in my BACnet into one of them, my, bod, my Modbus into another one with two different communication cards. <clears throat> so for your, for your 20s and 60s, that means how many, I guess, uh, so you can do, um, depends on the configuration that you use. So you can actually do, there's, there's a uh, unbiased um, 45 that automatically comes on here, but you don't want to use it unless you really have to or you want to put certain equipment that doesn't need biasing on there. So there's one there, okay? Then you can do, um, there's a spot for two more on an FX60, but I can do two dual port RS-485s, so then I have four, plus one I get, I have five. If I'm going to do lawn or something else, I, I lose those other two and I just get one back, okay, because there's only able a spot for one lawn. The same amount of slots, Rob, on the 70. Yep. Four yep. Plus your uh, default one, which is five. Yep. And there's actually um, an RS-232, which is this one here, um, and it uses some some kind of protocol I haven't seen yet. It's something really old that's industrial. I just don't get much exposure to it, but you can pull something. Something needs 232. The other neat thing too, this is wireless. Um, so now you're getting into and seeing a lot more often um, wireless uh, comm protocol. So you're not running any, you're not doing any of this daisy chaining. What you're doing is you have these little flags The, uh, I'll show them to you afterward, just zip that in there. So this is a PCV VAV controller, actuator built in, and this little flag here is a BACnet addressable wireless COM protocol, so you don't run any kind of communication wires from controller to controller. Um, these things link up with a, a Zigbee mesh wireless system. And they talk to a uh, coordinator right here, this little antenna. So you'll see the, uh, the, the wireless antenna right there. What would be, what would be like the cost difference between buying that wireless signal and maybe running 200 feet worth of um, Your savings comes with labor. Okay? Um, it's going to be about the same hardware cost possibly even a tad tiny bit more um, for wireless, um, but you're not having to have somebody out there pulling wire for hours or days to go out and do it. He's asking so. to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> so the, uh, <laughs> 
Yeah. yeah. So there's something wrong with this. If you know, and you've been to the church. Yeah. It's just, I think we got a problem with distance. Really, yeah. You know. So the uh, like in the gym. You know, something like that where you either don't want to run conduit across the wall and make it look ugly, you, you can install something like this on the wall or, or wherever and it speaks wireless and, you know, uh, goes back, does whatever. For me to be clear on that, um, it's those wireless and then communicate to a, another supervisor uh, board, which is maybe in the main mechanical room, then that connects to the actual. Yeah. I am um, computer, but I guess I guess what I'm asking in a larger building like mine, wireless, uh, can those be adapted with some sort of amplifier or uh, signal strength? Well, the way that they work is um, because I've got a lot of I've got a lot of uh, St. St. Leo's, the Bride, a lot of colleges who use wireless. Mm -hmm. and I don't want to interfere or have any kind of disruption in my. Uh, I got you. Yep. So we got the coordinator here. All right. Then we're just going to have controllers all over the place. They want roughly a hundred feet. It's what you want, but it changes. Okay. That's the one thing where wireless quite isn't here yet, is because one time you'll set it up and you'll have, you know, 200 feet line of sight, and why the heck is it picking it up? You know, well, hey, it's working great. And then in the next place you got 50 feet and it's not picking up. So it's not quite there 100% yet, um, but it's getting there. It's way better than what it was, and it's really good for those just tough applications. I've only had a few people go out and they've done it successfully, go out and do a whole building wireless. Okay, but the way it works is it uses something called um, this, this instance here uses something called Zigbee Mesh, okay? So what it does is it actually, this can be 150 feet away from here, okay? But what it's gonna do is it's gonna bounce off another one. So there's, there's only 75 feet from here. So it's gonna hit this one, and then it's gonna bounce over to this one. And then the same thing, they may use this guy. So they, they be, these guys may be 100 and, 50 feet away from the coordinator, but this guy may be only 75 and they'd be only 75 from it, so they'll use this to get back to the coordinator. Path of least resistance. Path of least resistance. And then if this one, this one falls out, okay, something, something goes bad here, it, the system won't even let you set up unless you have three hops back to the coordinator. You have to have at least three with, with this PCV with the wireless. But then it can go, so if it loses this one, then these guys may, you know, hop down and see, well, I want to get, I want to get here, and then, you know, I don't want to draw it all out, but you see, you see I'm going with it? It's just a mesh system, and it, it's, uh, when things fall out, it, it pops back in place. So the, the amplifier back to that would, uh, can those be amped up a little bit? To yep, so if you had, you could put another coordinator or another um, just flag itself um, out here somewhere and get out to that if you needed to. <laughs> All right, so back to comm cards. Everybody good on that? So that's the hardware that sucks back into the J's, okay? All right, power supplies, there's all different kinds of forms of it. Den rail mountable, wall plug, drivers. This is the other part that makes it neat. All right, so everybody at home has got a mouse on their computer probably, or at least is, knows what one is and plugged one in. Now you know when you plug your mouse into the side of the computer for the first time, um, if you have Windows, it makes that little sound, and then in the bottom right it says now installing driver. All right, same thing you put a, a webcam in, or so anytime you put in something USB the first time, Windows automatically installs some sort of driver for you. This needs a driver as well, too. So if you're going to do a lawn system, MacNet, Modbus, whatever, um, you're going to need your communication cards, and you're going to select those on the JACE, which ones you want, and you're also going to buy your driver as well. And then that's what allows these controllers to talk to that JACE. So you have the hardware side of it, and you have the software side of it. So multiple languages require you to buy multiple drivers? Correct. Yep. So
So yeah, you may run into an instance where you have, highly unlikely, but you may run into an instance where you have um, too many different languages out there and you'll buy two different, you'll buy two JSONs and, and a supervisor because you're going to have to run a bunch into one JSON and the others into the other JSON. Okay? I don't like it because we can, we can get you, there's just different ways. Good, good, um, con good contractors will go out and, then, and figure out a way to go out and, and make it work. The consideration with JSONs more times than not is the issue we were talking about earlier with your bandwidth, your network speed, you know, that type of stuff. <clears throat> right now, the uh, last time I saw a driver list, it was three and a half pages long, three columns, um, about an eight point font. So, however many that is, a few hundred um, different things that are out there, and the majority of them sit on an RS-45 or an IP connection. All this was saying is that um, if you're going to do a uh, if you're going to do a supervisor, um, there's different drivers for a supervisor that you buy as well too. Supervisor is the one that you connect multiple JSs to. Okay. Right. You mean like you, can you back up your station and stuff? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Um, this just goes on with your alarming, so you can send yourself SMS, you know, text messages to whoever needs them. Um, Freeman loves that, right, Freeman? <laughs> and then the uh, emails and, and all different kinds of stuff. Or you can actually have them sit there on a on a portal that somebody's looking at and something flashing on the screen saying, "Hey, come look at me. Something's something just a little bit out of whack." No, I knew it was in there somewhere. So the uh, so you're looking at your um, processor's a little bit bigger, your uh, your memory, all that stuff. So you're just getting into more um, what's available, how big it is. And I think we've beat that dead horse. Sure. Box a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, these programs relate controlled lights and other things. Mm -hmm. on yep. Uh, like um, you might have heard of Wattmaster. You had a question. Go ahead. Um, I'm, I'm just you know because my doors, my parking lights, all my building lights, architectural, automation, everything is on one system. Yeah. Yep, we can pull it in. So those actually have a COM protocol, believe it or not. Um, if, if you're going to suck in your lighting and stuff, um, all those are going to wire back into a lighting panel. And that lighting panel is going to be a back net lighting panel or a lawn lighting panel or something like that. And it's, it's kind of neat because you see a panel you know, that big or four times as big, depending on what you have, or several of them. You know, and you're just bringing everything back in and there's one little com bus that comes out and you can daisy chain them together and bring them back into one option slot, card slot on your Jace. And then you can actually, there's something now called, uh, just talking about parking lot lights, um, there's a bullet is what they call it and it's wireless and you install it right on your, um, your parking lot light and uh, um, it's wirelessly com bus Zigbee mesh back to, uh, you know, back to your, your Jace, your home run. Scheduling, uh, we've kind of touched on a lot of this stuff, but essentially this is kind of the lifeblood of what makes it make sense. I'm sure a lot of you guys, this, this is a tough crowd because you're all in the HVAC industry, so most of you people have programmable thermostats at your house and they're actually programmed, but the majority of the people out there, I mean, the shoemate guys, I'm sure if you're, if you're on the residential side, you're going to go out and you're going to see that all these programmable thermostats that just aren't, you know, aren't programmed at all. Um, where that's, that's crucial. You know, there's no point in your house needs to be 68 when you're at work. You know, run some kind of program in there, do whatever. But what this does with scheduling within the Jace is I can write one schedule that all of these controllers, everything that's on my network, are all going to talk to and that's what's going to tell them to be in occupied or unoccupied mode. Then I can write a schedule for holidays. So I go in and put all U.S. holidays into it and I can tell that 
that calendar override any days that conflict on that normal you know, Monday through Friday schedule. I can go in and give access to the coordinator for events and stuff. So like if the church is doing something on Saturday morning that they you know need to do whatever, they're gonna tell Freeman or somebody there, hey look, we need to have this scheduled. This training room, they told me it needed to be scheduled from this time to this time. So we go in there and tell it, you know, hey, do this. You can do it in advance, you can do it right then and there, you can go in and do a temporary override. There's several different things depending on what you're doing with your program um, to make this uh, make this work, but that's really the lifeblood, and that's where you get a lot of your energy savings, believe it or not, right off the bat, is people don't schedule their buildings properly. Alarming. <clears throat> so again, we've, we've touched on this, just several different ways to get notification of problems. You can escalate alarms, so if if you've got one that's not been acknowledged, somebody's just too busy or not doing what they're supposed to or whatever, you can have it escalate into somebody that's, you know, a boss or something like that. They can go in and, and check it out. Historical data management, we talked about that. All of your trending reports. Totalization. So, if you want to know, um, you can take you can take your. Uh, let's say that we had a mod bus uh, um, pump or or something like that, and we had two of them. We we're doing lead lag, something like that. We could go in and say, okay, how, what's the run time on this one? We can actually take that and see it, so you know. You know, the last one, you know, kind of copped out on me about here. Maybe we should tell somebody in budgeting purposes that our last one popped out about here. What do we need to do for this one? That's just saying that you're sharing all your data there, remote access, you can get to it from anywhere. So I was saying earlier, you can go into your IP address and, and pull up and see what you have. All right, I'm gonna show you a couple more things, but um, basically our, our DDC sales team, whoops, is uh, myself, Stacy McCammon does all the end users. Um, building manager, so she just kind of parks her car in a parking lot in Atlanta and then walks the whole day to different buildings and does different stuff. Um, Tim Shambly is just left. He was back there the whole class, but he's our light commercial guy, um, drive expert, so if you need to know anything about VFDs, anything like that, Tim Shambly is the guy to call. Um, and uh, he does light commercial buildings as well, so he does the web vision, um, the kind of DDC in a box application over here. <clears throat> if you need to control it or measure it, Stromquist & Company has a control solution for you. With over $2 million of inventory between our Georgia and Florida locations, an easy-to-use online ordering platform, same-day shipping, and a factory-trained team of controls experts to answer your questions, Stromquist & Company continues in its tradition of offering great service and great products. 